focusing on the people to see how can tech open the doors from learners across all contexts. Also, South Africa is the most unequal country in the world, according to World Bank. So our heart is no matter where a child is born, they have a chance to experience excellent maths and to make an informed choice. Maths is for me. Messy and masterful. In this podcast, we speak about the success of people who have achieved, built or done something amazing, special, remarkable, noteworthy and or fabulous. Think of presidents, doctors, chefs, architects, filmmakers, writers, philosophers, CEOs, journalists, and the list goes on and on of people who've had a genuine impact on this world. But rather than underlining their career victories, we speak about the challenges they needed to overcome to actually get there. In each episode, we discuss three of such challenges, obstacles, difficulties, and or hurdles with our guest, putting the messy of their lives next to the masterful. A very warm welcome to you. My name is Aldo Bob, and I'm so happy you could make it. So sit back, relax, and download the podcast here. Hello, hello, hello. A very happy new year to you. I know, I know I'm not supposed to anymore. It's January 18th and you're supposed to stop saying happy new year after January 3rd or whatever it is. But I don't care because uh, 2024 is here. It's here with a vengeance. And I sincerely hope that it will be a magnificent year for you in which all your dreams may come true. I also hope it will be a year that uh, you will come back to Messy and Masterful and you will listen to all the great interviews that we have lined up for you. And the next interview that we have here is no exception. It is an interview with two very remarkable people, two former teachers in South Africa who, whilst they were educating uh, the children in their school, saw a massive, massive gap. Uh, specifically when it came to numeracy. They made it their vocation, they made it their passion. And more than a decade later, they built this amazing organization called Green Shoots, which is active in South Africa, helping loads of students to further learn mathematics. And not only in the school, but also outside of the school with a mobile phone. And you know, there's a lot that went into it, loads of blood, sweat, and tears of two amazing people called Joe Besford and Mark Swartz. It was a true privilege to talk to them. They're really people that uh, I would say are made of gold. You will never in your life meet anyone more sincere, uh, more hardworking and more honest and more focused on on impact than these two people. Um, The interview was recorded uh, late last year when I was in Doha for the World Innovation Summit for Education. And yeah, our producer, Natalie, uh, loved this interview so much. And she said, like, this should be the opening interview of 2024 because it energizes, it inspires, it, uh, it'll it make you laugh, it'll make you cry. Without further ado, have a listen. Episode 71, interview with Joe Besford and Mark Swartz, the teacherpreneurs. Yes, and we are back on for another episode of Messy and Masterful. Um, we're still in Doha, end of day one. Um, we've had many interviews and spoken to many interesting people. But the thing about the World Innovation Summit for Education is it just doesn't stop when it comes to interesting people. And my next guests are no exception here. I have here as my guests the lovely Joe Besford and Mark Swartz from uh, an organization called Green Shoots uh, from South Africa. A very warm welcome to the both of you. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Thank you. Joe and I know each other well because we were part of the Wise Accelerator. So Doha, we will always have Doha, Joe. (laughs) So we met in 2015. Yeah, and... uh, Getting old. Getting old, <laughs> getting older, I always like to say, not old, old, we're not old. Um, uh, but yeah, we were part of the same kind of cohort, growing our 
projects or our enterprises through the support of WISE. And we had quite a good time, didn't we? It was an excellent time to learn and grow. Yeah, to learn and grow. And well, uh, we've certainly grown, whether, whether it is as we had foreseen, we, you know, we don't know, but we, we're, we're still around. So we should, we should be happy and proud of that. Um, take me back to Green Shoots. Uh, so also if you could just explain to the listeners what Green Shoots exactly is. Okay, so Green Shoots is an organization founded by two ex-teachers. So we were both high school maths and science educators. And we were presented with the issue that not enough high school students in South Africa were taking pure maths. And a lot of money and time was being invested in high schools at the end of a learner's career. But we could see the problem started in primary school and that learners' foundational maths, that they weren't getting the foundational maths they needed. So by the time they get to high school, they were, they were either struggling with maths or they, they didn't like maths. Yeah. Everybody says, oh, maths isn't for me. Plus, it goes against a generational thinking across a lot of South Africa, maths isn't for me. Maths isn't for me. So we had a chance to look at using tech as an enabler but focusing on the people to see how can tech open the doors from learners across all contexts. Also, South Africa is the most unequal country in the world, according to World Bank. So our heart is no matter where a child is born, they have a chance to experience excellent maths and to make an informed choice. Maths is for me no matter where you are. Mm. So that is where Green Shoots was born. Mm. Um, quality maths, no matter where you're born. Yeah. And so t- take me back to the very beginning of Green Shoots, because you were not originally from South Africa. You emigrated, if I mi- yes. migrated to, to, to start t- the project. Take me to the very beginning of things. So when you, when you first arrived there, what was there? And kind of how did you... How did you initially start it, like, you know, getting it from zero to one? (laughs) Zero to one. So actually, Mark and I were working with the Western Cape Education Department, had a project called the Kenya Project, which was about bringing technology to schools. So Mark was uh, working in a region and um, I was working on implementing in schools. And we were working at high schools and primary schools and... uh, international funder came and said if you could do things differently what would you do and we had a secure job with the department it was a brave decision and we gave up that job to be given a blank piece of paper he said I have the funding for 16 schools the department is going to let me implement what do you want to do some people would freak out for Mark and I it was like let's go We pulled together a team and we more or less said, we have to show that tech used sensibly with people supported can shift the needle in primary schools. Mm. Um, We were actually independent consultants for two years and it started to work. So we needed an entity with which to scale and grow this and Green Shoots was born. And we always get asked about the name. It's not Green Sheets or Grassroots. Uh-huh. Green Sheets is using the um, economics term, the financial term about regrowth where there's been barrenness. Mm. And that's maths. Yeah. We want to see Green Sheets of Recovery in primary maths education in South Africa. That's the name. Mark, you South African born and bred? Yeah, I think you. Uh, the only thing to add to that was that even these learners, when they go home, It's being reinforced often at home that uh, when the child gets home, then the parents say, don't worry, my child, I wasn't good at maths. Mm. So it's a generational thing that we needed to really get to and shift. And it was always so important to make sure that the parents are involved throughout the process. So we needed to get the parent involved involved throughout. And, and, And that was very important. All the stakeholders, from the school to the officials to the to the homes. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting, and, and Joe, you and I had many offline conversations about this, which is, you brought it up, it started when an international funder said, what would you like to do, right? That's beautiful, but there's a beginning and an end to that, because at a certain point you run out of money, right? Oh, yes. So, when exactly what the, was this, and, and, and how did you overcome that? How, what did you do? 
It's an ongoing journey, yeah. but the biggest thing to attract additional funding is you have to, from the beginning, show evidence of impact. Yeah. So before you even start is know what are your metrics? What does success look like? We heard it today in WISE. What does success look like to you? That was what the WISE Award winners was look like. And for us, it's improved teaching and learning in maths. Mm. And since we've grown, it's also in the management of maths at a systemic level. So we had to demonstrate that learners were learning better at maths. Teachers were feeling more capacitated to teach maths. And the, the data we were able to secure was changing what classrooms looked like. So then after the international funding finished, the first people to stand on board then were local donors. Local donors who said, I want to see this in schools that I have a concern for. And in fact, those same local donors mm. who start are still with us today and growing their support. So, and they have brought others into the journey. Yeah. Um, so it's a hard one because you have to, Mark has a phrase, you're only as good as your last job. Mm. If you are not showing continuous impact, if you are not showing... Um, change lives then people walk away yeah. and for us we never advertised it was yeah. it was growth because it was organic growth we want that you're saying a couple of things that I think are very true I, I do think uh, yes, sorry I uh, just want to put in a bit, a bit of nuance there because and I had an earlier conversation with Isabel Howe who is the director of the uh, Stanford uh, accelerator for learning and we spoke a lot about impact because mm. previously she worked for the Omidyar network mm. and was focused on impact. And I said, well, what defines impact? Right. And I think, yes, you're very right. It's kind of, you know, here are the metrics, here are the statistics, but you also need to get buy-in for the impact, Absolutely. right? Because I think that's often a difficult one because you can care very much about statistics and data, but someone else might not at all. And that's often where I think the conversation might go in another direction when people say, well, actually, those are the wrong metrics, which could be, you know, from funder to funder, it can vary, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever come across whereby impact for one organization wasn't impact for the other? I think part of our model is about socially embedded change. We don't do things to anybody. No. We don't come and fix people. So we have solutions so part of the impact is by design, working alongside people to say, in your context, what does success look like for you? So we've always made sure that there are qualitative indicators of success based on people's mindset and practice shift. Mm -hmm. And that looks different in every context, because if people don't buy in, then it's not sustainable. Yeah. So our model from the beginning, socially embedded, what does this, how does this work for you? And that is messy and it's time consuming and a big function. There's three components of what we do. The tools, the data, but it's the warm work. And what distinguishes, I think, us as Green Shoots is willing to walk that journey with people, knowing it's not a race and they're individuals. Nobody can dispute the impact of changed lives. <laughs> Of, of hearing people saying, this was where I was, this is where I'm... Yes, there's always data. Yeah. And you have, to have, you have to get the balance between both. So we have always honestly fought, not fought, but fought to make sure that anything we do is balanced between quantitative and qualitative because yeah. context matters. Yeah. Context matters. And a 2% rise might have been a mammoth thing and a 10% rise means nothing. So it's actually got to be situated in what is happening in that environment and how, how have people been brought along the journey so that they don't need you. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. the best indicator of, of success is when you can walk away and they don't need you and they're doing better than you even thought you could do. Yeah. Sometimes when you start any program, the audience are often not clear about the exit strategy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So right from the start, you need to be clear around the table as to who's doing what. That's very important. And the last six months of any program that, that people need to know where does that baton change, where's that handover happening. And that goes to the system when it comes to the education department also. And when that's clear, then you can call people on it. Six months, a year. Uh, that transparency is really important yeah. when you take this on board. 
I would be interested to know kind of the delivery of the program, right? Mm. Um, I, you always, and I made fun of that. I do apologize, but I, I think it's I, because I think it's very sweet. You, you, you always say it's not the hardware, not the software; it's the warmware. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, You're uh, learning. What, let's start. What do you mean by that? Warmware people. Yeah. No tech ever solved anything. Yeah. Especially in education. Yeah. It's the people, whether it's the learners, the teachers, the school management the people at home, the system. It's the people who engage with the tech. And if they don't see the value, and if it doesn't change what they do, it's, it's, a, it's a fun toy that changes. Yeah. But it actually has got to change how you think to impact. It's got to land in the classroom. The classroom, the school, the system, the home has got to look different. And the tech is the thing that sparks it and that allows things to happen. Yeah. So that is the warmer bit, is the, is the people. So by that you actually mean guidance? Like War, guidance yeah, it's, yes, yes, who yes. The, you know, the Identifying the stakeholders, yeah. understanding what is it they need. Yeah. You don't go in with a solution. You sit and listen, and that changes, that's the thing. Yeah. You're working with a, a system. When we say the system, we mean teachers, school management, district, provincial officials and they can be the governance that to do with the management of schools but also the curriculum and the assessment yeah. but it's the ecosystem there's communities there's faith-based groups there are businesses who are embedded in the community who have a vested interest or care about the community they're part of so it's it's bringing all of these together mm. so an understanding what do you need okay i can't help you with this but yeah. this bit can really make a difference and sometimes it takes Time for people to realise, oh, there's fears, there's there's misconceptions, there's busyness, and it's it's in it for the long haul. Mm. That's the warmer bit. That's the warmer. <laughs> Let's talk about the delivery of your program into the yes. schools. And I can imagine, so you've been doing this for 10 years? 12 years. Yeah. So I, I can imagine that the program has evolved, Ooh. right? So yes. it's kind of like you started very basic and now you, you were just mentioning before we hit the record button, 131 One million answers submitted so far this million year. million answers so far. So that's enormous, right? Yes. So that's, that's a lot more data than you could ever have yes. imagined. <laughs> yes. <laughs> how, how do you keep up with your technology so i would like to talk about the software bits. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> again heard in wise sometimes the low-tech solutions are the most effective to scale mm. especially if we're talking in a sub-saharan african context and um, just before we even impact explain the the software the key thing for us is inclusivity if it can't reach all it's not a solution for us so we deliberately go for low-tech solutions. That means no matter where you are, you can access the maths because otherwise it doesn't meet our criteria. No. Um, so we used a web-based browser. We don't use an app because immediately that excludes. Mm. Web-based means anybody who can access the web can access the, the tools that are, that are used. Um, and as, as Mark says, our, our software runs on a, on a washing machine. So you can, you can fit it, you can get it on anything, because there's a huge cell phone penetration in South Africa, but it's not smartphones. Mm -hmm. So as long as they've got a web browser, we use online browser-based program, uh, LMS software, that is um, minimized for low data use. So it means there's a lot of things we'd love to do, which we can't do. Because it means either that schools with 40 kids trying to connect will not be able to access it because the yeah. internet isn't strong enough. Yeah. And it's minimized for low data use. So the, the actual software is that um, learners have an individual login yeah. that is based on their uh, unique student number that follows them through their school career, which means it then can link into educational reporting for the department. Yeah. And you log in with your username and password that is linked to your school, linked to your district, Link to your province and then we have we also worked out we didn't have the luxury of content for reaching every child and I'll explain this is that learners in schools might see a computer once or twice a week 
if you have delivery of content, then they don't have enough data, they don't have headphones. So we worked out in maths, and research has shown that feedback on how learners are doing is one of the most effective strategies for primary school maths improvement. So we took every question in the syllabus for six years, mapped it, the difficulty, uh, two languages, glossary. So learners log in and they do the sums for the week, but the sums start easy so that if you are really stuck, you can see some success and it yeah. progresses. Yeah. And then they submit whenever they want, as many times as they want, and they that's what I got right. And you see in classrooms like, yes, you have class sizes of 40 to 60. Mm. You are not going to get your books marked, even the best teacher. So by the time you get your books marked, you don't care about the sum. Kids want to know. They, everybody thinks they got it right till they see a cross. And they need to know, oh, I don't understand that, miss. Yeah. And also, they don't feel judged by computers. So the, we always say the biggest user of our data are the kids. Not the adults, the yeah. kids. Yeah. It's very basic. The magic happens when we pull it into the data warehouse and what do we do with that data? Mm. And then it's, it's the, the different dashboard displays that are customised because we've sat with parents with teachers, with school, what do you need to influence your job? Yeah. And then it's being able to provide the customised displays, queryable, because everybody wants to see what they want to see. Yeah. Um, so that from our provincial dashboard, mm. you can see how every child did on one question across the province, or you can see how Aldo did on question four. What did Aldo say? Yeah. And so then the power of that data in real time, in primary school, in rural schools, in huge township schools, suddenly gives an insight into how learning is happening or how learning can be helped to happen, which was just not available. And so we've had to grow our dashboards. We've had to grow, as, as the COVID, huge. Everybody suddenly went home, yeah. learning at home. Yeah. And now all of a sudden parents had to teach and their parents hadn't done maths. Parents didn't know maths. You might have parents who have low literacy or numeracy themselves. Mm. So we, we had to design an online report card for parents that didn't actually even need you to read. Mm. It was colour-coded. Mm. So we use things like, you know, everybody can read a field dial. You go from red to green. Mm. So, you know, have you covered the curriculum? Red to green. Mm. Every activity was colour-coded. And everybody knows you go for green. So we tried it in a very, very mm -hmm. rural setting with um, actually Afrikaans language speakers. Mm -hmm. And we said to parents, can you understand this report? Where are your kids not doing well? Red bit. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's, un it's using tech, Those things, yeah. but understanding where yeah. people are. So 131 million answers submitted. How many students is that? We have got on the system about 380,000, but not all are active because of the contextual realities of some schools. Yeah. So in any one week, you may get in front of a computer once. Yeah. And, you might, and then the other thing, talking about tech, we're really proud of this development, is that, um, I, I should show you the pictures, kids have to share. So you have 15 devices or 20 devices for a school of a class of 60. Yeah. So you have three bums, two chairs, one computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're working together on the sums, but you're okay. logged in. Yeah. But we've got a yeah. capacity now on our system. We're at the end. We've, you just put the numbers in. Mark and I have done all the thinking. Yeah. And at the end it says, yeah. did you work with anybody? And yeah. then Mark logs in, I log in, and the data gets allocated to everybody who shared and worked so it, I, it gives you the group work and we can yeah. actually separate out yeah. to find out which schools are having to share yeah. and then that was a whole new additional there and that opened the door for some of our most challenged contexts all of yeah. a sudden they were flying yeah. because now they and, and actually collaborating in maths is a great idea yeah. so that was a, a innovation yeah. that was driven by context yeah. Yeah, that, that particular innovation also then forced the system to realize that with your little devices that you have, 
and what you're doing, then if there's a particular resource available, then maybe we should focus on offering it to them versus yeah. another school. Yeah. And, and that really sh shifted the system's thinking there yeah. also. You could identify who was making the most of the tech mm. they had and were having to share three people and they were making it work. Yeah. We have schools of 1,200 learners yeah. who are making it work yeah. with minimal technology. Yeah. So they should be rewarded when there's more. But there's something else to that. Sometimes when we were at school, teacher doesn't look at my homework. At the moment now that the learner can go home, do the work at home, and their portfolio of evidence is shifting, and the teacher can see that tomorrow. Yeah. So you don't have to necessarily have a teacher that's with you all the time. Yeah. Um, because we all were like, if nobody looks at my homework, how do we feel? <laughs> yeah. So, so it covers that one also. Yeah. It's beyond fascinating, and I think we can talk for hours. I, 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 I want to go back to the part, because I think this is also what our listeners might be interested in, is the bit where you kind of want to sustain, right? So the, it's amazing what you're doing, and of course that should continue to exist, but you are dependent on donations and funding and kind of uh, things happening like that. But just for the people who have a similar intention, would you do it again that way, or would you do it differently? And also on, you know, on the same breath, what is the biggest challenge here? You just mentioned like it's a continuous journey. so. Mm. Could you speak a little bit about it? We actually had to, we started off with a fully non-profit. Mm. But then we had to work at getting a different type of funding in because in order to sustain tools, you actually have to have a social enterprise to grow yeah. a tool. And the minute we started realizing we would have to grow a tool, we actually had to have what we call a hybrid organization. Mm -hmm. So by time of WISE, we were actually hybrid. Okay, yeah. Where we have a fully non-profit, and that is, that is the biggest challenge, is to keep separate total lines of community, separate entities who are symbiotic. Yeah. So that the, the tool and the development of the tool is in the social enterprise. Yeah. And why we say properly social enterprise is that all any profit is going back into making yeah. sure that tool is developed but also we are currently sponsoring as the social enterprise over 200 schools who yeah. don't have funding to use the tool yeah. so we made a conscious decision that mm. if an individual school came to us we would sponsor them till we could either find because the, the csi funding for the tool there's the department who wants to fund the tool but we, we are looking at how do we pull people in yeah. who say, we want to fund the impact. The warmware is where foundations, donors, because most foundations are not interested in paying for tools. But yeah. the department or the education system, yes, we will purchase, we yeah. will tender a tool. But they don't have the funding to do the, the fuzzy, cuddly bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but for the... The revenue that goes to the social enterprise. Yes. Does that is there any sales generated, or are these still kind of funding mechanisms? Is it still somewhat? It's from still funding. It's yes, yeah. yes, yes. So it's you're, still, you're still funding. On funding. Yes, it's yeah. still funding, but it's funding. Um, there, there is the CSI funding, um, but the biggest shift, which took time, and we had to work our way up, mm. is to get the education department partnering so we started small so what we found was actually um csi funding showed success so a donor who was willing to fund the social enterprise yeah. bit showed that in 16 schools no in 55 schools it works so yeah. the education district said we want more so they put their money in yeah. then two other education districts in the same province put their money in yeah. then the province said no 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 and we, they, we won it for 500 schools. Yeah. And it was, it was catalyzed by, yeah. but you had to show success, catalyzed yeah. by CSI, yeah. but pulled the donor in. Yeah. Then, because the department's put its money in, there are other foundations who are willing to say, okay, we want to give support to the department, so we want to be able to fund the, the teacher support. Yeah. That the department itself is saying, look, we'll pay for the tool and basic training, but the, yeah. the hand-holding, yeah. the lead practitioner programs, the, 
it's a different model and it is complex and it's tiring and there's a lot of governance and that is the challenge and you're constantly sorry I still give Mark's grey hairs <laughs> is, uh, is having to make sure that your lines of governance and organisation is crystal clear yeah um, but, but it's not I mean I understand it and I understand also the separation in entities but you haven't adopted a subscription you know software as a service subscription model to the schools right there's no charge to the to the recipients because there wouldn't be any point right that's yeah yeah. and and go ahead so having said that we that that was an option on the table and we got some guidance in terms of that but what we realized was also that by offering this tool to every school not just to those that was in challenging communities was very important at another level because often your learners don't talk to one another because they are different schools yeah and we need to fix that so the school doesn't pay that was important for us so the parent doesn't pay the school does but we we do expect the education department to make a contribution to make this especially if if things are working or yeah. other yeah. interested parties yeah. Yeah. and it's interesting and and one of the things you said people who love your job we went a different way we love we wouldn't do any other way we went a different way we put, and and we were told we were crazy but we have now seen other organizations think there is another way to do software or to do there yeah. is another way no, no, I... there is another way and 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 sometimes you need that crazy person to say yeah and we always say green shoots is a pathfinder mm-hmm. and it takes deaf people like us and that's why we love what we do yeah. there is another way and now we're finding people coming to us and say how do we do this other way yeah. and we're saying and it is tough yeah. and and you you have to realize that there is a different cost to you as a yeah. director as a founder yeah but the the reward in changed lives yeah. is just yeah. i think that's that's for me as well the the biggest reward being 10 years in with teach pitch mm-hmm. whereby we've had an impact on tens of thousands of teachers mm-hmm. yes. and tens of thousands of students and uh, th- there's no, you know, and that's what, what, what I founded it for, to have that impact. You know, the other side is, you know, the, the impact in and of itself, so that's, uh, that's also why I asked, because the impact can, you know, that's so valuable to us, right? That's mm-hmm. so valuable to you. Whereas the money bit is always, as you say, it's always hard work to get it somewhere. And sometimes it's, you know, there's the promise of money that then falls through oh yes <laughs> the, you know, or, or the money is then not properly loca- uh, located or it's like you know oh, yes. so there are so many hurdles to that and then at the end of the day you're not you know you don't become wealthy of no. it right whatever no. you get goes into the organization <laughs> yeah so it's a hard it's a hard journey it's a choice right? and we now have a team of 18 full and part-time staff who also made that choice yeah uh, they have made that choice, and and our thing is we pe- we want to make sure that it's a we have to be sustainable as a business. Yeah. Otherwise, these learners, these three hundred eighty thousand learners, are dropped. Yeah. So we have to be sustainable as a business. Yeah. But it does mean sometimes development has to wait, yeah. or yeah. because actually we can't always do what we would like to do. Yeah. Um. But the first thing we have still got to be here. Yeah. Otherwise, we're getting these learners uh, tasting something and then we take it away from them. Yeah. So, yeah, you yeah. have to have sustainable business. And, and how we also assess whether, because often we, th- you know, we want to know, is, is the customer still appreciating this? Yeah. So those f- first 16 schools that we spoke about, yeah. we go back to them all the time. Yeah. Are you still Happy. considering this yeah. to be a good service? And that's a, yeah. that stays an important thing for yeah. us to do. Very last question before I go to my three last, very quick last <laughs> questions that I ask every uh, every guest. 
What does the future bring? So, so one of the things I'm thinking is like, okay, 380,000, 131 million. Do you want to double that? Do you want to expand? Do you want to go to other countries? What would be the ambition? If we talk at WISE 15 and 2030, how big is Green Shoots then? Okay. Yes, if this is working, then every child, first of all in South Africa, but neighboring countries in Africa, deserves quality maths. What that looks like will change within country contexts, but we want to scale it more widely in South Africa, absolutely. Why are we at WISE is the potential of AI to sensibly, <laughs> sensibly attach to this. And we heard today how um, AI cut from 45 years to five years, the impact, yeah. is how can we use sensibly directed to actually accelerate what is happening in schools. Yeah. So there's a growth in what we can offer and also to bring more people into the party. Yeah. There are more people in the ecosystem who can align their efforts to make yeah. sure that maths... So it's, it's going out, getting more in and doing more with the people we've got. Yes, and we don't want a secondary education system. We have to capacitate the system to not need us. So in more years, that we shouldn't have grown that much bigger. We should have had local partners, local implementers, and a system that actually just needs the tool because yeah. they are they are running without us. Yeah. So it's it's higher quality, and if it's expansion, it's within South Africa. You're not going to go. No, we we more. we would be delighted. We'd be looking at that for the whole <laughs> we time. would definitely yeah. um, and and finding partners who have that mindset. Who have okay. that mindset? So you would expand internationally. If, if yes, you had yes. The right and okay, I'll be straight. Um, it's not people who want to make a book out of education technology. It's people who want to see the country changed. Yeah. And yes, they have to be sustainable, but it's yeah. it's not to make a book. It's yeah. to change lives. Yeah. So, do I gather correctly, you're open for anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because yeah, yeah. we've never done the the normal thing. Yeah. We've never I mean, done I mean, the normal you're thing. We're open for anything, provided it's the right partner. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. That's the, yeah. it's a non-negotiable. Yeah. It's a non-negotiable. There, there was one thing that we were asked two years ago. So somebody asked us whether we'll go into a different discipline like languages, as an example. Yeah. And the short answer was no. Yeah. We would like to stick to what we know. Yeah. And, and because people look at the platform and they think it could just be. Yeah. You could transfer to, to, to a different uh, subject area yeah. also. And we would like to, obviously the next thing would be physical science, but we would like to, yeah, physics. We would like to stick to maths and then obviously physics. Yeah. And we're now expanding obviously to the high schools also. We're, we're, we're now expanding our offering to get that primary high school transition yeah. mm -hmm. where we lose kids. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like quite a journey um, <laughs> and, and an amazing one. My uh, three very last questions. Um, well, we just have to figure out how we do this. Um, Mark, you first. Could you finish this sentence for me? As a child, I wanted to become a... Architect. Architect? Yes. You're not an architect? I'm not. What happened? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I've always wanted to, to do drawings. I I um, I could just not go to university, yeah. and um, I got a bursary to go and study education, nice. and um, I ended up doing technical drawings and maths. Yeah, which so close enough. It was close enough. Yeah, yeah. good on yeah. you. Yeah, and of course, you know those circumstances. You yeah. should also think about that. It's not just you can have the ambition and the aspiration, but if it's economically not feasible, yeah. or then other things apply, other rules apply. Joe, what about you? As a child, I wanted to become a... Never a teacher. No. I didn't actually know what I wanted to do, but it was never teaching. Okay. My grandfather in the Caribbean was a headmaster. My mum was a teacher. I swore never education. And here we are. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> no. well, actually, you're, you're I love science. Anymore. No, I'm a teacher, but I, I love science. Yeah. So things to do with science. I, I loved earthquakes and volcanoes. Okay. So maybe a scientist? Yeah. 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 Um, reading. Yes. So on your journey, on your 12-year journey, growing Green Shoots, has there been any reading that inspired you guys? Any book? Yeah. Could be anything. Could be a novel, whatever. It doesn't have to be like, you know... Um, 
to me that out, that out less traveled comes to mind and um, yeah that out less traveled comes to mind for me yeah it's nice. the choices you make yeah choices you make yeah good you know for me it, it's more blog posts it's actually blog posts and, and I can't give names because you put me on the spot but it's of people who have booked the system and gone their own way okay and people who have gone a different path and it's like okay you don't have to follow the rules mm. and if you have it I'm always the one who customizes it or goes so <laughs> goes yeah. the other way yeah, he's yeah. laughing because he knows me yeah. but it's it's looking for people who say you know if done wisely and sensibly so I, I will I will search out people and what have you done differently? Okay, let's do it. So it, it wouldn't be so much as a book as I look look for people. You like stories. Yes, like more stories, yes, and stories yes, like that, and yeah. and even through wise, it's it's following some of the stories. Um, uh, is it Selena Yakubi uh, from Afghanistan? Yeah. Following and thinking, yes, wow, yes, yeah, can be done. Yeah. Wonderful, nice. Mm. And then the very last question, let's turn the tables. This is the Green Shoots podcast. <laughs> Who would you like to have as your guest? For me, it would definitely be um, the Minister of Education. Okay. South African Minister of Education. At the moment, yeah. Mm -hmm. That comes up for me. Uh, I'm going to go totally other way. <laughs> Sia Khaleesi, the Springbok. Um, running rugby captain because he has a story he's he came from a very underprivileged background he is now you know pinnacle of success and everybody wants to interview him but just yes we need more role models so I would love just because I'd love to interview him anyway but yeah. <laughs> I would love to hear his story yeah um, and ask the questions I wanted to ask. Okay. Well, a call out then to the South African Minister of Education, <laughs> Sia Khaleesi. Please, we want he's to talk in France now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on our podcast. We'll, we'll set it up. <laughs> Joe and Mark want to speak to you. Thank you so much, Thank guys, you, for Aldo. your time. I wish you all the best in Thank the growth you. of Green Shoots. Undoubtedly, we're going to hear a lot more about your great work. Um, thank you so much for putting in the effort for 12 years yeah. and uh, keep on keeping on. Thanks so Thank, you. Thank you very much. If you liked this episode, then it would mean the absolute world if you could share it with your friends and or give it a short review on your preferred podcast platform. The more you share your ideas about these interviews, the more people will find out about them. So do let us know what you think. We'd be very, very grateful. Special thanks to Philip Anderson for our beautiful theme music. This episode was edited by Natalie Piles with production assistance from Genta Metalia.